Good morning. Here we are again in snowy New York. Uh, fifth snowstorm in three weeks. Okay, so I'm going to continue with celestial astronomy, the celestial sphere part two. Now, uh, I'm going to give you just enough to get information to get by, to have some command over this. Um, actually, I won't leave details out, but I won't spend a long time at it. There are many lecturers on the web who do quite good versions of this. Okay? Plus, I'm not a, an astronomer, and I, I might use different language. For example, I sometimes prefer to use uh, degrees where astronomers would use hours. All right, so where was I? The motions of the Earth are very complicated, and to do this right really would require a great deal of effort. Now, the motions of the Earth have to be configured for uh, GPS, right? If you want an accurate GPS, you have to put a lot of detail into the computer programs that you run. You'll see why in a minute. So we're doing the celestial sphere. Celestial coordinates is what I'm doing. And um, there are many coordinates. Let me show you how. Or how many. We take the Earth and we take our position. Here in New York City, we're approximately 45 degrees north latitude. So when we stand on the Earth, and we look overhead, we see our zenith. And through that runs our zenith meridian. Okay? Now we have looked at latitude and longitude. I'll go back over that in a real quick in the last class. Now, you could have set up a system of coordinates whereby you construct an imaginary sphere over yourself. This would be your zenith, and this would be an altitude of, let's say, a star. This angle here. And all the way around, where this would be north, and this would be south, and this would be west, and this would be east, you could construct the second part of your coordinates, for every dimension you need in the coordinates. So, Looking down on it, you would have your degrees, north, south, east, and west, and then altitude, right? You could use those coordinates. What's going to happen, though? Pretty soon the Earth is going to start moving in its rotation and its orbit. And whatever star you were looking for is going to be long gone. Well, it will be gone in every coordinate system, but it will be gone in a special way and hard to follow with these coordinates. I'm only going to look, and there are many other coordinates. There are sun-based coordinates, moon-based coordinates. We're only going to use right ascension and declination because it's very neat. And when we look at right ascension and declination, the fixed stars have their own unique latitude and longitude. And because the mo movement of the stars in the sky are very short, small over long periods of human time, they have a fixed coordinate, latitude and inside and out, latitude and longitude. So I've introduced already latitude and longitude on the surface of the Earth. So the surface of the Earth. Has parallels of latitude and meridians of longitude. And you can localize a point there. The first meridian of longitude goes through, not Greenwich, Greenwich in London, the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, Royal Naval Observatory. And that's the first meridian where you start counting your longitude and you can start going east or west, east longitude or west longitude, till you get 180 degrees east or west on the far side of the globe. That's the international date line. And from the equator, you can measure your altitude. That will be your latitude, and this will be your longitude. Okay, so that's what we did for latitude and longitude. We also said that the ancient observers, because they needed to establish calendars and they needed to farm, observed the motions of the sun. And a good way to do it is to mark the motions of the sun. So the sun will come up in the east, 
the most easterly part, twice a year on the 30, 21st of March, called the Vernal Equinox. It's got a different symbol actually. Vernal Equinox. And the 21st of September, the Autumnal Equinox. Right? And it's going to be lowest in the sky on the 21st of December, when we have the shortest days. And it's going to be highest in the sky on the 21st of June, when we have the longest days. And I'll talk about this angle some other day, but not today. So these are going to be solstices. And these are going to be, and there's another solstice, equinoxes. Equinox for equal night, day and night are of equal length. A day is going to be 12 hours, and a night is going to be 12 hours. Okay? Now, let's track this path. Well, one way of tracking the path is what it does every day. Every day the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. But throughout the year, it has a different path. Throughout the year, you will see different stars in the vicinity of the sun because it's moving across what's called the celestial sphere. The path of the sun across the celestial sphere is called the ecliptic. And it generates a plane in our coordinate system tilted of 23 and a half degrees to it, which we'll see in a minute. So we're go going to do... Now, okay, let's do some of the people we talked about the last day. Now, I said that... Uh, Joanna Kepler was a student of Copernicus because for some stupid reason the last day. Tycho Brahe was the person of whom Johannes Kepler was a student in Uraniborg. And he was Tycho Brahe was Danish and he was the last of the great naked eye observers. The last ones to use no telescope, but still plotted the planets' motions and the stars' motions on the celestial sphere. Kepler came up with his laws of planetary orbits, and he believed something. Instead of accepting a theory of gravity not yet invented by Newton, he believed in William Gilbert's theory. Now, William Gilbert was a man before his time. He was the father, as you like, the father of, I hate that phrase, but the, one of the founders of electricity and magnetism, the theory of electromagnetism. He identified particles of electricity and the magnetic force, and he thought that the and the first, I, the first unified theory, really, he had germs of that in his head. He looked at the Earth as a magnet and studied the Earth as a magnet. And he thought that the Earth and the Moon were held in orbit, mutual orbit, or attracted to each other through a magnetic force, right? And this is a long way before his time because he lived, that's William Gilbert, in his book De Magnete. Cyclopedia Britannica published that book again as one of the great books of humankind. 1544 to 1603. 1603 was the, I think, the flight of the Earls from Ireland. They went away and got poisoned uh, uh, in Scandinavia. I think Queen Elizabeth I might have died in 1603 as well. I can't remember. Around that time. Gosh, I've forgotten. Okay, so Johannes Kepter lived between 1571 and 1630. And you can see he was born a generation after... Uh, William Gilbert, all right? Now this guy is a contemporary of William Gilbert. Died in 1601, almost the same years of lifespan. So let's now look at celestial coordinates. measure these coordinates in degrees and each degree would be equivalent to 15 sorry each 15 degree step on the as you'll see what's going to be a celestial equator would be equivalent to an hour but astronomers measure these in hours because one definition for these these coordinates would be where is a star well it's two two hours behind the sun that would be its right ascension sorry if its right ascension was 30 degrees, you would say it's two hours behind the sun. In other words, the distance behind the sun 
on the celestial sphere is the right ascension of a star. We'll see that in a minute. Now the other, so this is celestial longitude. Now, celestial longitude is going to be right ascension, celestial declination, sorry, declination delta, which goes from 0 to 90, positive or negative, it's going to be celestial latitude. So get your head around that because I'm going to show you what that means. Okay, I've got no diagrams on the board. I'm going to erase this and put the diagram down. Do two diagrams. First of all, this is the celestial sphere. Inside the celestial sphere, we'll put the earth. And what is this? Well, the ancients looked up and they saw the night sky. All right? That is the celestial sphere. It's flat. Now, we know that the stars are all different distances away, but for all intents and purposes, they appear embedded on a flat sphere inside out. We're looking at the surface of that sphere inside it. The sphere, we're in it. So there's the earth. So there's going to be a north celestial pole and a south celestial pole. What about the equator? And we project the equator. We get an image. Of the equator on the celestial sphere. Which we call the celestial equator. Now what about latitude? Latitude is pretty easy. We'll deal with that one first. Latitude works the exact same way and it's called, as we said a minute ago, declination. So we measure the angle. Suppose we have a star here. If it's 50 degrees north of the celestial equation, we say it's positive. 50 degrees declination. Just a slight difference in notation and that's its angle. Sorry. Okay, that's the angle of declination. But of course, you could have a star down here. Below the celestial equator, we give it a negative sign, right? Okay, so that's roughly speaking what the angle of declination is like. Let's get rid of that diagram and look at right ascension. And the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and so do the stars. So if we look down on the earth, the earth will rotate anti-clockwise to make sure that the, here the sun rises in the east. Because here's America, there's Alaska, and you get Florida and Mexico, right? And there's New York City, and there's, let's say, um, Anchorage. So we see the sun come up here. So for the Earth to catch it, suppose the sun is rising here, the Earth has to go this way to make sure that you see the sun come up in the east and go down in the west. So the, the Earth goes anti-clockwise. And 21 is the magic number for everything. We'll deal with that in a minute. So that's our direction. Uh, 
down. Now that's not very good, but I just want to move ahead. You get the idea. Okay, so we need a longitude now, a longitude on the celestial sphere. We have the North Celestial Pole, and Polaris, the North Star, is going to be up there. And we have the South Celestial Pole. And there's no delineating or special star down there. And we have declination as being this angle as measured north or south of the celestial equator. There is the celestial equator. Now we need a, a celestial longitude. There's a point, there's a meridian of celestial longitude, and it goes south as well. And it's going to go all the way around the, the celestial equator. It was going to go from zero, zero, let's call this zero for now, to 180 degrees. And then from zero to a much, to, well, let's go all the way around to 360 degrees for now. Okay? But astronomers don't do that. They call the gaps in here hours because they use that to spot stars. Because in practice, what you're doing is you're just looking up at the night sky and you're waiting for the particular star and it's okay. We'll have to do this idea first. The equivalent inside out longitude on the celestial sphere is going to be right ascension. And we look down on it for now. Now RA stands for right ascension. Well, let's do it 24 hours. 24 hours. So that zero hours de de right ascension is going to be 24, and we're going from 6 to 24 in this particular case. We could have used degrees, and we could do break up all of these in their respective hours, okay? Now, meanwhile, we have our de declination. So to locate a star, we have right ascension, and declination. Okay, so the lo located star, we need those two coordinates, and here are some more details now I'm going to put in on that. That's looking down on the celestial sphere, and the celestial sphere, let's see how does it rotate. If we're looking down on it from the North Pole, North Star, it has to go this way, I guess. No, it has to rotate this way. I think, looking down on it, to make sure that things rise in the east instead of the west. Let's check that. If the sphere rotates this way, here's a star. Sphere, we're watching it. Sphere rotates this way. Ah, it's the other way. I have to check that. next time. Now I want to deal with something else, something on the celestial sphere that is crucial. How do we begin measuring right ascension and declination? Here's the celestial sphere and here's the earth. Here's the celestial equator. Now, objects that are fixed on the celestial sphere will be the stars. For example, we could have the Ursa Major. Ursa Major, sometimes called the Big Dipper, sometimes called the Plough. 
If we project these two guys, then we meet up with Polaris. This is a constellation, right? Let's put the sun in on the celestial sphere. We put the sun here first. Now if the sun is there, it's in the middle of the sphere. Day and night are going to be of equal length. So this is going to correspond to, if the Earth is spinning, this sun is over the Earth's equator. It's sitting on the equator of the celestial sphere. Therefore, it's matching up with the equator on the Earth. Now that means if the sun is on the equator, that's the middle of either autumn, yeah? Oh, sorry. Yeah, middle of autumn or spring, 21st of March or 21st of September. So we'll call this the 21st of March. It's called the variable equinox. And has a symbol gamma that goes around a ram's head. Okay, so the variable equinox is going to be the beginning of where we start counting right ascension. So zero degrees right ascension, or zero hours actually, zero hours right ascension. So we call, just say zero hours. OH, like an OH radical. Now let's look at the sun when it's midsummer. Midsummer in the northern hemisphere. It's highest in the sky, and this angle is 23 and a half degrees approximately. Okay? Now, that's because the Earth is inclined to its axis, and why that happens and why we actually see this sun traversing across the celestial sphere. It'll traverse down to here in the 21st of September. And over here, 21st of December, because the sun is low in the sky, it's going to make that the winter solstice. Summer solstice, winter solstice. All an equinox, vernal equinox. And let's join the dots. We get a plane inclined at 23 and a half degrees to the celestial equator. And we're going to give this a name. The ecliptic, right? The ecliptic is what? What is it? It's a path. It's the path that the sun takes across the celestial sphere throughout the year. It will appear in a different part of the celestial sphere. In other words, if you look up at the sun in the middle of the day with a telescope, and you can do that, right? You will see behind it a particular constellation. There are 12 different constellations on the celestial sphere that the sun could reside in. One in January, one in February, and it's going to be in the middle of those constellations on the 21st of each of the month. 21st is the magic number. 21st for everything makes it easy to remember. I'll go through those in a minute. I'm going to erase this. Now that path corresponds to a, an orbit of the Earth, because this, the Sun is not orbiting the Earth. Remember that. Some people before Copernicus thought that the Sun was orbiting the Earth, but it appears to orbit the Earth. It appears to go around this celestial sphere, but it's actually us that's doing the orbiting. Okay? So here's the celestial equator. I did not do a good job. Here is the variable equinox, here is the autumnal equinox, here is the ecliptic.
Now, the plane of the ecliptic is inclined at 23 and a half degrees to the celestial equator plane. Okay? Now, right ascension is found by measuring with respect to the celestial equator. Nothing is measured with respect to the ecliptic except for the zodiac because all the constellations of the zodiac reside there. When the sun sits it, when the sun blocks out uh, a particular constellation, let's say Taurus, if the sun sits into Taurus and we can't see Taurus because the sun's in the way, then, we're, then that corresponds to the sun sign or zodiac sign of Taurus. That's when you have your birthday in that particular region. We'll talk about that later. Okay, the ecliptic is a path of sun. What else can I say? Let's do some examples. I don't remember all these locations, but if you're an astronomer, you should do. Now, Alpha Centauri is a star, the brightest star in the constellation Taurus, Alpha. Beta would be the next brightest, and Gamma the next brightest, and so on. But Alpha Centauri is the brightest, and it has a right ascension in hours and minutes, and it has a declination. Fourteen hours and forty minutes. And has a declination sixty degrees fifty-six seconds. Arcturus is another star. Arcturus, if you take the Big Dipper and follow. Follow its tail and you'll arrive at Arcturus. Okay. Fourteen hours and sixteen seconds is its right ascension. Nineteen minutes, sorry, nineteen degrees eleven minutes is its declination. Beetlejuice. Five hours and fifty five minutes uh, right ascension. Sorry, that's not right. Is that right? Plus seven degrees, twenty four minutes is his declination, I think. Sirius, the brightest star. Oh, Beetlejuice. To find Beetlejuice, you go and find Orion. Orion is that kind of a constellation. It has this shape, you know. There's its belt. Beetlejuice is that star there, okay? Now, Now there's more to this, but I'll just do the following for today. Okay, the right ascension of a star is also the time behind the sun. So let's say we have a meridian that goes right overhead. That's called our local meridian. On the celestial sphere, the coordinate of right ascension that goes over our heads, right, on, a, on our zenith, that's going to be our meridian. Now let's get the sun to move and arrive on our meridian. So now the sun, oh well, let's, Let's just watch the sun come up on the horizon, okay? The sun comes up on the horizon. This one here. 
five hours and 55 minutes, let's say approximately six hours. The sun comes up on the horizon. Six hours later, the sun is going to be right overhead, exactly six hours later. And what will have happened? Beetlejuice will be five minutes above the horizon. Do you get that? Approximately six hours. The sun goes up and Beetlejuice is six hours behind it. 14 hours. Alpha Centauri is going to be 14 hours behind the sun. That's a good bit. Look, it's more than half a day. Alpha Centauri is 14 hours behind the sun. If the sun rises, actually Alpha Centauri is probably going to be over the far side because of, yeah, if the sun rises, Alpha Centauri will be two hours up into the sky. You'll still have it on the horizon. Okay, so that's the way Rhymes Engine Television works. We'll do some more examples the next day.